Good day, all. This is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar, and we are going to uh, continue on acid base uh, imbalance part three. So, I was talking about um, uh, the machines analyzing pH, and I'd um, said that 7.40 is perfectly normal, but there's a range between 7.35 and 7.45. And the reason that is because our, our, our measurements can never be 100% accurate, there's always going to be a little bit of uncertainty, um, but we allow a um, Wiggle, wiggle factor, if you want to look at that a little bit of wiggle room on either end, plus or minus, and the amount of wiggle room that we allow is something known as a standard deviation. It's a, um, that is a statistical calculation, and we generally will allow for two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below um, what we're looking at. In the case of pH, um, that's going to be 7.40 is what we want, two, two above, 7. Um, uh, four five two below seven point three five. Okay, so normal pH, normal bicarb uh, HCO three is twenty two to twenty six milliequivalents per liter on the bicarb. Normal carbon dioxide is thirty five to forty five millimeters of mercury. That's our normal acid base balance. Okay, so let's talk about um, the two problems. The two general problems that we can run into with acid-base balance. The problems can arise from two areas of the body, respiratory or metabolic. With the respiratory system, one of two things can happen. I can either blow off more carbon dioxide than normal. I can either have hyperventilation or hyperpnea, get, get rid of, of carbon dioxide uh, more efficiently than I should. This will blow off carbon dioxide, this will decrease the level of a carbonic acid and this will create what's known as a respiratory alkalosis. I'm blowing off acid, carbon dioxide, and I'm going to become alkalotic so my pH is going to be higher than 7.45. Likewise, if I run into a situation where I'm not ventilating very well, I can't get air in and out of my lungs very well, maybe I've overdosed on a drug and I'm breathing two times a minute and not responsive, maybe I've overdosed on a narcotic, uh, maybe I have a disease process and I'm in severe what we call respiratory failure. And as you will learn later on in this course, there are two types of respiratory failure. There's a type where we don't ventilate very well, get gas in and out of our lungs. And then there's another type where we don't oxygenate very well. And there's actually a third type, which is a combination of both types. Um, failure to ventilate and failure to oxygenate. But respiratory failure is something I'll touch on now, but um, we'll, we'll go into it in a lot more depth later on. But at least you have some, some background knowledge on what, what, what uh, they'll be talking about later on. Okay, um, when we go into this failure, we don't ventilate effectively for many, many reasons and reasons that you guys are already um, talking about at this point because I know that you're talking about patient assessments and uh, ventilation, oxygenation, and so on in, in your lab and lecture exercises. So I won't go. I won't belabor that point too much. Uh, now the other area where we can get in trouble, other than the lungs, with acid-base balance, is going to be the metabolic system. Um, generally, this is going to involve a fixed acid. Um, lots of different things can cause metabolic derangements. Um, one of the things that you'll often hear um, will be nausea, uh, vomiting, and diarrhea. And this is the way I look at it here. What do we have a lot of in our stomach? Well, we have a lot of hydrochloric acid. The pH in our stomach is very low. So if I vomit a lot, what am I doing? Well, I'm vomiting up a lot of acid. So I'm getting rid of acid. So what's that going to do to my pH? Well, my acid's going to get low. So my base is going to be high, and that's going to cause alkalos excuse me, alkalosis. So um, throwing up, vomiting excessively, alkalosis. However, diarrhea coming out the other end, I lose a lot of base, a lot of bicarbonate. And excessive diarrhea can cause metabolic acidosis because I'm losing my base. So acid out of the mouth, base out of the butt, if it's coming out both ways, lots of things can happen. Okay, um, and prolonged gastric suctioning, um, as you'll learn in critical care here in about a year and a half. Um, in ICU, Often patients that have uh, are intubated and they're on a ventilator or breathing for them, they'll have a tube in their stomach and sometimes they have that tube to suction and excessive suctioning of stomach contents can also cause metabolic um, 
alkalosis. Okay, so we're good there. Uh, metabolic acidosis, lots of things can cause metabolic acidosis. I can become hypoxic and my cells aren't getting oxygen. Oxidative phosphorylation or electron transport chain fails. The Krebs cycle fails. The acetyl coenzyme A that goes into the Krebs cycle um, backs up. Pyruvic acid can't, um, can't be turned into acetyl CoA. And acetyl CoA can't be processed. Um, and this leads to production of um, lactate. And then lactate, of course, breaks down into lactic acid. And that's where the lactic acidosis associated with shock comes from. That's the pathophysiology of lactic acidosis. Uh, when I actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about shock a little later on in this pathophysiology course. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's the basic uh, reasoning. I can have certain drugs. Uh, certain um, overdoses can cause metabolic acidosis. I, um, and um, we're not going to talk about the anion gap in this pathophysiology course, but the anion gap is something that we will talk about a little later on in respiratory um, school. Uh, but there are certain substances that can elevate the anion gap. And then there are certain types of acidosis um, called hyperchloremic acidosis where the anion gap is not elevated. Both types, anion gap and hyperchloremic acidosis, are um, metabolic. Both types, they're just, just subtypes of metabolic acidosis. Um, kidney failure, renal failure can lead to metabolic acidosis because I can't uh, get rid of my fixed acids as efficiently. Um, liver failure as well, if I have liver problems or cirrhosis, I can have ammonia back up and uh, certain metabolites of drugs back up it can cause acidosis. Uh, overwhelming infection and sepsis can cause acidosis. Uh, uh, just uh, profound illness, prolonged fevers. Um, like I said, lots of different substances can cause metabolic acidosis. And um, sometimes uh, when patients develop metabolic acidosis, the respiratory system tries to compensate for that. And um, they will... Uh, sometimes breathe faster, breathe deeper, and you have heard of diabetic ketoacidosis. You guys are aware of that. I'm not going to talk about that in depth because you've actually already talked about it um, already. With your patient assessment, it produces a Kussmaul's breathing pattern. You're breathing very uh, rapidly and deeply, and the reason that is is because you have a metabolic acidosis, but your respiratory system is trying, even though the respiratory system can't get rid of those fixed acids, it can get rid of the volatile acid, carbon dioxide, so it'll keep your CO2 or carbonic acid levels lower than normal to try to compensate for all these other acids that are floating around. Um, so you will see that. And then sometimes in patients that have chronic respiratory failure, have chronic lung disease, um, and their carbon dioxide is always elevated, um, their kidneys will actually come in and compensate for their respiratory acidosis. And the kidneys will make more bicarb, hold on to more bicarb, so in somebody that has chronic lung disease, it's not uncommon to see their bicarbonate um, greater than 26 because their kidneys are trying to compensate for the chronically elevated um, levels of carbon dioxide and carbonic acid. Um, and that's called a, a compensated um, uh, respiratory acidosis. That's not something acute. That's not something you'll see in somebody who's acutely ill. That's a chronic thing there. That's somebody who's, who has chronic lung disease, uh, COPD, something we'll talk about um, here in a little bit. Okay, so that's your basic introduction to acid-base balance. Again, not a credible amount of depth, um, but just giving you the pathophysiological foundation to better understand all these other lectures that are going to be hitting you um, as you progress through this program. Okay, guys, take care.